Thanks very much. Let's get rid of that. Ah, okay. So thanks very much, Cam. I think you misheard. I didn't say I was going to be making waffles. I said I was going to be taking waffles. So you're going to need to get there ahead of me. Okay. So we're going to be talking about multi-agent systems today. This is going to be a little bit different from a lot of the talks we've seen at the school, where they're giving you lots of solutions to your problems. You know, we, there, there's wonderful things you can do with reinforcement learning. There's wonderful things you can do with deep learning. There's many solutions. You can wind up fixing the world with things that you've learned previously to my talk. In my talk, we're going to be talking just about problems. Okay? So I don't have a lot of solutions for you. But what I do have is I have a lot of problems that come when you get more agents, right? A multi-agent system, that's just a system with multiple agents. Nobody in the entire universe has ever said, you know what I think would solve my problem? I think it would be helpful if I had more agents in my system. Nobody who is thinking straight ever said that. They're not solutions. They're problems. But they're super important problems because they're problems we can't avoid, right? Everything important, once you get down to it, is going to wind up having multiple agents in it. And so we need to be aware of those problems, and we need to at least know where the minefields are so that we don't do anything naive and lose a foot. So before we start that, we're going to just spend a couple more seconds in our comfort zone, OK? This is our safe place. Single agent systems. I, I made this awesome new diagram that nobody has seen before, so we're just going to go through it. So in a single agent system, you've got one agent with one environment. The agent is the agent. That's the thing you control. It's got some goal. You may not control it directly. It may be autonomous, but it's the thing that you've told what it wants. Okay, you either give it your goals or you give it its, its program. The environment is literally everything else. Okay? Agent takes actions. Environment changes or maybe not. And then the agent receives a reward from the environment and then some observation of the state. We know kind of what we want to do here, right? We know what our we know what our objective is. Okay, so now let's turn this system into a multiple a multiple agent system. So how am I going to change this system in, from a single agent system to a multi agent system? Just shout it out. It's not a trick question. More agents. All right, let's add n minus one more agents. So once you've got this system things get complicated. But the, the point I want to make with this slide is not just I added more boxes and now things are complicated, although that's also true. I'm not very good at, at drawing things. Um, the point I want to make with this slide is that agents here mean something special, okay? It doesn't just mean robots or, or software agents or something. For something to really count as a multi-agent system, the agents have to be autonomous. And I mean that in a specific way. So we, we think about autonomous agents a lot in reinforcement learning, right? We think about agents where I haven't told it exactly how it's going to achieve its goal. I just kind of give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down every now and then, and it figures it out on its own. That's what we normally mean by autonomy. I mean something very slightly different here. What I mean here is that the agents are endowed with goals, okay, either by us or more frequently by someone else. And those goals are something that aren't under the control of a single entity. So every agent has its own priorities. Every agent has its own goals. Okay? If you've got a robot soccer team, for instance, you've got a whole bunch of robots, they're all trying to kick the ball into the goal, I assume. I would claim to you that that system with, I mean, not when they're playing the other team, but just when they're out on the field by themselves, I would claim that that system is a single agent. Because the goals of the robots aren't autonomous. They're all trying to do the same thing. They're all kind of parts of the same agent in some sense. Okay? So that's one distinction I want to make. Um, okay. So the other point I want to make that I guess is kind of required for this sort of talk is I, I bombastically claimed that everything is multi-agent systems at the very beginning, so I guess I kind of need to back that up a little bit. Multi-agent systems are important. They're everywhere. And furthermore, they're everywhere more so. We're going to see this a little bit later. But things that didn't used to have multiple agents involved or things that didn't have to have didn't used to have multiple agents involved in particular ways, do now, right? So what do I mean by that? What is a multi-agent system in our world? Games, of course. You're playing against the other player. You don't get to tell them to lose, typically. But even things like auctions, and auctions are in places where you wouldn't expect them to be. 
the Canadian government, the American government, they have sold billions upon billions of dollars worth of, of spectrum recently. They've been, they've been clawing it back from TV stations and they've been selling it to cell phone providers. That's, that's all been done with a fairly complicated auction. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, do, but I do wanna pick out another couple that are perhaps remarkable. So one of them is the kidney exchange. So this is happening right now. So in the kidney exchange, in almost every country in the world, it is the case that you cannot sell your kidney, no matter how much you need the money, and no matter how much somebody else needs a kidney. And that's for ethical reasons, and that's for, um, for, for reasons of worry, worried, worries about exploitation, right? We're concerned that the people who are super poor might wind up selling their organs, that just seems like a dystopia. Nevertheless, something happens with kidneys where you can't just donate a kidney to anyone. You have to be a match. And so in a kidney exchange, you can come in with a pair of people, one person who's willing to donate a kidney and one person who needs a kidney, but they can't donate to each other. The kidney exchange is a system where you can say, well, this person is gonna donate their kidney to someone who needs it, and that person's donor is going to donate to the, to the original person they came in with. So this allows us to get around the problem that you don't have money, that you can't just do a straightforward exchange. But the way to make it so that the incentives work is, is kind of complicated. Okay? So that's one that I really wanted to highlight. The other one that I wanna highlight is that we see this all the time in situations that don't involve people, right? Agents are not just people. They're not just what you would normally think of as a software agent. Internet protocols count as an instance of a multi-agent system. They're massively multi-agent systems. And at the level of um, border, go border gateway protocol, at the level of large internet domains, they're agents in my sense, right? You can't tell everybody how to run the protocol. You can't enforce any particular protocol where they're going to honestly report to you how much traffic they have to route. It turns out that you can carefully allocate or sorry, carefully set up your protocol such that everybody runs the algorithm in an honest way because they want to. Their incentives have been aligned. Okay, so that's, that's a real win for multi-agent reasoning, even though I promised I wasn't gonna give you any wins. Okay, we've heard this a couple times already. We heard this at, particularly in Dale's talk. I wanna belabor this point a little bit. Multi-agent systems are non-stationary, okay? And they're non-stationary in a special way in that every agent is part of every other agent's environment, right? So agent one, their environment is everything except agent one, so that includes agents two through n minus, two through n. And similarly, agent n's environment includes every agent from one to agent n minus one. And they're non-stationary in a special way, right? So we've, we've heard a lot about non-stationarity. The world is non-stationary generally, so why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because of the way in which it's non-stationary. It's non-stationary because the agents are changing, by which I mean the, some agent's environment is changing, in anticipation of what the other agents will do. So while I'm reasoning about my environment, while I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to interact with my environment, my environment is simultaneously reasoning about me. So I can't just do some straightforward learning on it because it's, it's learning about me and the learning that I do, it might be trying to mislead me or it might just be ineffective. Okay, here's, here's one of my hobby horses. Multi-agent objectives are often unclear, okay? So I asserted, I asserted earlier on in our safe space slide that we know what we want in a single agent system. We know what we're up to, right? We're trying to pick some, we're trying to pick some policy pie that's gonna maximize the expected sum of our rewards, the expected discounted sum of our rewards, say, conditional on either the environment or our understanding of the environment. This, this is straightforward, we almost never talk about this because this is just what we're doing. So now let's suppose we've got multiple agents. What is our objective now? Well, one thing we could try to do is we could say, well, there's lots of agents, agents are good, we want to maximize their reward. We want this system to perform well overall. So maybe what we want to do is we want to, um, we want to pick a profile of strategies, we want to pick one strategy for every agent, such that the sum of everybody's reward is gonna be maximized. That's one thing you could imagine wanting to do, but that's gonna run afoul of something I've already told you about, which is autonomy. I don't get to pick the other agent strategies. 
I am at most one of these agents. So maybe I can pick pi sub one. But I can't pick pi sub two. The other agents get to pick that. And they'll be picking that in response to their own optimization problem. So this is actually not a fantastic objective to try and target. You're not going to be able to do this, at least not the way I've written it. So what do we actually do when we're trying to operate in a multi-agent system? What objectives do we target? Well, there's one thing you could do, which is still fairly straightforward. You could do what I call agent design. You could say, well, I only really get to control agent I, so I'm going to pick the strategy for agent I that maximizes the rewards for agent I. Okay? And the, forget about the other agents. I will kind of just treat them as part of the environment, as we said earlier. Mechanism design is another thing you could imagine doing. You could imagine saying, I'm the government, I'm a platform owner, I'm somebody who maybe isn't even an agent in the system, but I care about the agents. I want the agents to do well, I, want to I do want to maximize the sum of everybody's reward. That is, in fact, my goal. I can't do that by picking everyone else's strategy. Right? I can't pick policies for the other agents. They're autonomous. But what I can do is I might have control over the environment itself. Okay? I might set up my platform. I might somehow set up the rules of the game such that the policies that the other agents pick are going to lead to an outcome that I find desirable for all the agents. So I've written this in the altruistic way. I've said, well, once I know how everyone else is going to try to react to environments, I can set my environment up so that they maximize everybody's sum of rewards almost in spite of themselves. There's a more cynical version of this where maybe I'm trying to maximize my revenue. Maybe I'm an auction platform. Maybe I'm selling ads. If I'm doing that, then I'm not really maximizing this. I'm maximizing something else, which is something like how much money these agents give me. So this part of the optimization will change, but the basic form is the same. I still pick an environment that's going to somehow do something I want, given the policies of the other agents, which I don't get to pick. Okay. But this all, I want you to notice, still depends on the policies of the other agents. I've been hand-waving a little bit about policies they might like to pick, or policies they already have, but in this second case especially, what does it even mean for agents to already have a policy in some environment I haven't even made up yet? So this is, again, something we're going to come back to, but I just want to point out that even at the very, very beginning, right, at the very first point where I sort of show up at my multi-agent system, I'm all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to go, I don't even really know what to do. I'm not sure what I'm targeting here. Okay. All right, question at the front? Did I make the assumption that the time step of every agent is the same? Ah, uh, sure. So I'm written, I've written it here in very reinforcement learning-y terms where we sort of have a stream of rewards. I'm actually going to just completely chuck that out, I think actually in the next slide. Okay, so it turns out that you can actually run into all of these problems in just a single period interaction. Just a single choice is going to be enough for us to run into every one of these problems, right? Imagine, imagine on these equations that big T is just one. Everything I said on this slide is exact, still, still goes through, right? Everything that I said on this slide still applies. Joshua? Yes, sure, that's true. So the question or comment, I guess, was except I don't get to, I don't get a chance to learn if I've got, um, if I've got big T equal to one. That's true. Um, so I haven't, I haven't told you guys yet, so there's no reason you would know this, but a lot of this lecture is going to be about game theory. And so I'm going to be talking in, in mathematical terms for a lot of the lecture. And so in mathematical terms, it turns out you can represent everything as a single shot interaction if you just make things meta enough, right? Like my, two, my policy now is not how I'm actually going to behave and then I learn my policy. It's going to be something like the way in which I'm going to learn my policy. And then I'll put it into the environment with your other way in which you learn policies. Great. Any other questions? No? Maybe later. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that multi-agent systems are important and difficult. So what we're really going to spend a lot of the lecture on is, is really getting a, even more precise about ways in which multi-agent systems are difficult. 
And it turns out that you can, you can really precisely put your finger on a lot of these difficulties using game theory. Now, who here has already heard of game theory? Yeah, everybody at the multi-agent systems lecture. I guess I'm not surprised. So game theory is amazing. It's just, it's, it's talking about multiple agents in math. You strip everything else away and just think about agency. And you can, you can learn some beautiful and distressing things. Okay, so how does it work? It is the mathematical study of interaction between multiple rational self-interested agents. So we're gonna change terminology a little bit here because now we're in game theory land. But we're gonna make some really strong assumptions, right? We're gonna assume that every agent is rational in some very specific sense. We're going to assume that they maximize their expected utility. What's utility, James? Well, think reward for now, but we'll be a little bit more precise about that in a minute. And they're self-interested, so I was calling this autonomous a minute ago. But I, I really want to point this out. The agents pursue only their own preferences. Everything that the agent does is based only on their own reward in this framework, okay? And if you were gonna be a straw man, or if you wanted to make a straw man of game theory, you would say, well, all those agents are psychopaths, and you know, what's that got to do with anything? That's not the reason game theory doesn't have much to do with anything. Because preferences can include the well-being of other agents. That's fine. My utility can include I want my children to be happy and I want everyone to smile at me when I walk down the street. That's all fine. But the point is, it's my decision, right? This is autonomy. You know, I don't, I don't have to do something just because someone else's utility function says so. If it's important to me, that's gonna get encoded into my own preferences. That's what's going on here, okay? All right. So. Let's start by playing a fun game. Before I even define game theory any further, game theory is fun because of games. Lots of you have seen this before, I'm sure. It's the prisoner's dilemma. It's got a fun story with it. Here's how it goes. There's two suspects. They're being questioned separately by the police. Joshua, would you like to volunteer? I would love to play. Oh. Can you really choose your utility is the, is the question. And I think that's a really great question. So I mean, I think kind of no, right? Like there's some, there's some preferences that I have that are innate. So I guess it's, it's not so much that I get to pick my own utility and I'm some kind of blank slate because what preferences would I even use to choose my utility in the first place? Um, but the point is more that I'm not, I'm not compelled to follow someone else's preferences, right? So my preferences can include things like I want other people to be happy. But it can't be the case that if I show up in a system where everybody likes ice cream and I don't, that somehow that makes me like ice cream. Again, behaviorally, it kind of does work that way with people sometimes, but this is math. We're all perfect spheres of rationality right now, okay? Okay. So two perfect spheres of rationality are being questioned separately by the police. Here's how it works. They, they're both totally guilty, by the way, okay? The cops don't know that, but we do. If they're both silent, Right? If, they, if they both cooperate with each other, not with the police, then they're gonna get sentenced to a year in jail just on some lesser charge, jaywalking or something. The cops will be mad, so they'll try and get them on something. If they both implicate each other, we're gonna call that defecting, they're defecting against each other. If they implicate each other, then they're both gonna get a reduced sentence. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna reduce, get a reduced sentence of three years. So, well, you're guilty, so I'm gonna convict you, but on the other hand, you ratted out your partner, so I'll give you a smaller sentence than what you would normally get. What's the sentence you would normally get? You would normally get five years. So if one of them rats out the other, one of them defects and the other one cooperates, the one who defected goes free. They get zero years in prison. The one who cooperated, the cops hate that person. They're gonna throw them in jail for the maximum, which is five years. Okay. I've written this down in a handy table for your reference. This handy table has a name, it's called a normal form game or a matrix game. And the way it works is you imagine that the two players pick something simultaneously. So one player is gonna pick a row, they'll pick either cooperate or defect. And at the very same time, the other player will pick cooperate or defect from the columns. And then we just, we just look up what the utilities are going to be. So the, the row player is the first utility in this list and the column player is the second utility. So if the row player cooperates, and the column player defects, the row player goes to jail for five years, and the column player get, goes free. So we'll represent that as minus five reward, or minus five utility. Okay. Does everyone understand how this game works? Awesome. Play it. 
So pick someone next to you and play the game. And we want to play it three times, and we want to play against someone new every time, OK? I've got a handy timer up here. I'm going to wait for two minutes, and then we're going to report back, OK? I'm serious. Oh, yeah, good question. So the question is, how will we represent our strategy? If you cooperate, it's one. If you defect, it's two. OK? One, two, three, go. OK, this is the most dangerous part of the talk, where I try to bring you back from the fun game. This is my promise to you. There will be another fun game. OK, this is not the last chance. OK, so now this is the audience participation part. I mean, you just participated. This is the part where you participate with me. So I'm going to ask some questions. It's going to be a poll. You just put your hand up. OK, how many people cooperated every time? How did that work out for you? <laughs> Poorly. I'm seeing some thumbs down. How many people defected on every go? You monsters. <laughs> How many people cooperated after ever having been defected on? That is heartwarming, but, <laughs> but rare. OK, how many people had a kind of a strong emotional reaction to this game? <laughs> All of us. Yeah, me too. OK, we're going to talk about this game again in more detail in a minute. Um, but one thing I want to point out about this game is that game theory makes a very sharp prediction about this game. Okay? And it doesn't match what happened. Okay? Ooh, mysterious. I'll come back to that. OK, what is the prisoner's dilemma? I already told you, because I guess I like spoilers, but it's an example of a normal form game. Okay. A normal form game is any game where agents just make some single decision simultaneously, and then they get a payoff, and then the world ends. Okay? And the reason it's called a normal form game, and not an abnormal game or a you know, prisonery game or something, is that it turns out mathematically, and this is, again, goes back to what I said to Yoshua a minute ago, mathematically you can represent literally any game as a normal form game. Right? If you say, oh, but you know, I'm going to do some learning. I'm going to do some gradient descents on something while I'm learning against the other player, and so are they, well, then that's just the strategy that you chose. You chose the action of learning against somebody else with gradient descent. Okay? So this is not a practical way to represent things. These things get huge really fast. But this is a mathematically very clean way to represent these situations. And it turns out that with small versions of this, you can already um, gain a lot of insight into multi-agent situations. So what are they formally? They're just a set of players. Let's just call them 1 through n. Every player has a set of actions available to them, a sub i. This overlaps a little bit with reinforcement learning terminology. Sorry, I was originally supposed to be in the deep learning section of this school, so I wasn't worried about that. OK, we're going to be talking a lot about profiles. OK, a profile is just a special kind of tuple. A profile is a tuple that has one entry for every player. So in particular, an action profile is a tuple that gives an action for every player. 
So an action profile is enough for me to look up in the normal form game what everybody's payoffs are. And then finally, the way you represent utility is you say every player has their own utility function. It just maps from action profiles to utilities. So once I've seen what action everybody takes, I get to figure out what my utility is. And I'm, I'm sh I was showing you the output of those functions in the matrix. Okay? All right. So let's come back to this idea of maximizing an individual agent's rewards. So in game theory, I told you a rational agent is one that maximizes their, the expected value of their utility. And this is, this is a very precise statement. It's an expected value. It's not the median value. It's not some, some upper bound on their value. Game theory will brand you irrational in some precise sense if you don't do, th if you, if you do that. In game theory, you are literally maximizing the, at the expected value of your utility given your beliefs about the other agent's policies. Okay, what is this funny minus i thing? So again, in game theory, you very frequently wind up wanting to talk about the profile of something something of all the other agents but you, okay? And so we just represent this with this kind of awful notation where you put a minus sign in front of i. You're not really, sub you're subtracting i from the profile. So pi sub minus i, it's just, um, it's just a profile of policies, one for every agent except i. So those are the beliefs that I'm gonna have as agent I. I'm gonna say, well, I told you earlier that I need to condition on what everyone else is doing, so I'll, I'll form some belief about the policies everyone else is, for, uh, is following, and then I'm going to take, I'm gonna look at every one of my actions, figure out what my expected utility is for each of those actions, given what everyone else is doing, and then I'll pick the action that maximizes that expected quantity. So pi, Pi sub something, so pi sub minus i is a profile, pi sub j is just one, one entry in that profile. That's gonna just be a distribution over actions. So again, this is a very simple way of representing the situation. We're going to, um, we're gonna throw away all notion of how we got this distribution, and we're gonna say whatever algorithm you're using, it's gonna cash out into some distribution over your actions, okay? So there's a shorter way to say this, which is what we're gonna say from now on. We're gonna say that an action is a best response exactly when it maximizes this quantity. Okay, so given my beliefs about everyone else's strategies, this magic action A star sub I is my best response to that belief. Okay. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I've kind of thrown a ton of definitions at you. In the back there? Great question. So the question is, you're assuming these individual distributions for each of the other agents. So are we ruling out cooperation among the other agents? And the answer is kind of. So in the actual normal form game, the answer is much crisper, yes, right? I can't pick some correlated distributions where I will go left exactly when you go left and I will go right exactly when you will go right. There's no way to represent that the way that I've written this. Everybody has to have their own distribution over their own actions, and so the probability of any action profile is gonna be just the, the product of the probabilities of everybody's action, everybody's part of that profile. But in some sense, you can, you can still get cooperation, right? You can get cooperation in this kind of meta sense where actually these, these actions are very complicated objects where they're learning algorithms or something. Right, so if, my, if I'm gonna say, well, my, my strategy is I'm either gonna play learning algorithm A or I'll play learning algorithm B, that decision won't be correlated with anything the other players do. But it's okay for that, max, that, that huge meta action to include things like, and now I'm gonna run a, you know, gradient descent, I'm gonna try and infer what the other player is trying to do, and I'm gonna try and cooperate with them. Right, these actions can be very large objects. Does that answer your question? Great. Any others? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, so that's a great point. So the policies of the other agents are actually unknown, perhaps, right? I might not actually know them. And that's, that's, why, that's why we're being careful to say beliefs, right? If I'm actually maximizing my utility, then my beliefs are correct. But if I'm rational, all that I need to be doing is maximizing my utility with respect to with respect to whatever beliefs I have. Okay. But that's an important point. 
Great. Are there any other questions? I have one. James, isn't it kind of a simplification to just talk about, like, a scalar utility? Like, agents can care about lots of stuff. So the answer is, they kind of can't. So again, I, there's, there's a whole field called utility theory. It's one of my favorite things. I'm not going to inflict it on you in this lecture, except for right now. And what it says is it, it gives a precise axiomatic definition of rationality. It says a rational agent will think in the following ways, mostly about probability. And it turns out that if the agent is, has preferences that, that think about probability in that way, that what any, anybody who's acting according to those preferences is going to be acting in the same way as an agent that's maximizing expected utility. So to be a little bit more precise, there is some utility function out there for any rational set of preferences such that maximizing its expected value is going to maximize those preferences. So I, I bring this up, well, partly because I love, you know, utility theory and I'm being a little bit self-indulgent, but partly because I think this is a common objection. I think it's a reasonable objection. This is a non-trivial theorem. Um, but I think this is something that's going to give you, the again, the wrong view of why game theory has nothing to do with anything. That's not the reason, right? It's not just that we're doing this simplified utility reasoning. Okay? All right. So what do you do with best response? Where do these beliefs come from? What's going on? Okay, Nash equilibrium is the standard game theoretic prediction about what's going to happen in a multi-agent system. And here's how it works. Again, we say every agent is perfectly rational in this game theoretic sense of maximizing expected utility with respect to beliefs. Therefore, every agent is best responding to the actual policy. So we're going to—it's perfect. Every agent is perfectly rational, and they're perfectly rational. They are super smart. So this is sometimes called the rational beliefs condition. So not only are they rational in the sense of maximizing expected utility, they're also maximizing it against the correct beliefs. Okay? Therefore, what does that mean? It means that any action that they're playing with positive probability in their current policy must be a best response. You might have multiple best responses at any given time, and so you're allowed to randomize among those, but you are not allowed to mix in something that's that's not rash or that's not a best response. And when I say not allowed, what I mean is if you are doing that, then you're not in Nash equilibrium. Okay? I mean you can do whatever you want. So we're gonna say that if you've got a profile of policies, okay, one policy for every agent, that satisfies this third condition, then we're gonna say that that profile of policies is a Nash equilibrium. And if the agents are behaving according to those policies, then the agents are in equilibrium. They are playing in Nash equilibrium. Okay? And so this is, this is the foundation of a lot of economics. A lot of the economics starts from the assumption that everybody's already in equilibrium, right? There's no point in picking up the $20 bill, because if it was real, someone would have already picked it up. So we're all, on the, we're all in equilibrium. That will be the starting, the starting assumption, and then you derive things from there. This is how things often work. OK, so let's look at some of these predictions. I'm going to show you another fun game. We're not going to play this one, but, but it's coming. So this game has the unfortunate name of Battle of the Sexes. It also has a fun story behind it. There's two spouses of whichever sex you prefer, and they want to meet up for an event. Oh, I see a question in the middle there. Right, great question. So I gave the definition of rationality, and then I made this big deal about perfect rationality, and I never defined what perfect rationality is. So the trick here is rationality and perfect rationality are going to be the same thing for these purposes. That turns out to be easy to define. Perfect rationality is, is, is basically just what I said. It's rational expectations and rational behavior. Okay? It turns out that the hard thing is bounded rationality. Right? So rational behavior is you optimize exactly, and bounded rationality is you don't. And so we don't want to just say absolutely everything that's not perfectly rational is the same, but it actually turns out to be kind of tricky to formalize what we mean by something that's kind of rational, or like rational to some degree. Great question. Anyone else? I thought I saw another hand. Same hand. Okay. 
Related to which, sorry? Sorry, I still didn't catch that last. Ah, great question. Okay, so the question is, is this related to common belief and rationality? That's another one of my hobby horses I'm not gonna, not gonna inflict on you. So, right, so common knowledge of rationality is, is a strong condition that basically Nash equilibrium is assuming. It's assuming that everybody knows that everybody else is fully rational and knows that they know it and so on. That's, that's one way of interpreting Nash equilibrium. It's related. We can talk about that more afterwards. Okay, all right, so let's press on to this awesome two by two game. So there's two spouses and they wanna, they wanna have a fun night out, okay? One of the spouses likes ballet, doesn't like soccer so much. One of the spouses likes soccer, doesn't really like ballet. For whatever reason, they don't have a cell phone or like email. And so they're just kinda just gonna show up to this, to this event and they're gonna kinda hope that they get this, the right one, okay? And so if they coordinate, they show up at the same event, they, like, let's, let's say they both pick ballet. Well, the role player likes ballet. So the role player is gonna get a payoff of two. But the role player also likes their spouse because that's why they're married. And so, or, and, and, and vice versa. And so the column player doesn't really like ballet all that much, but they're happy to be spending time with their spouse. So they get a payoff of one. The role player is better off. They get to spend time with their spouse too, but they also get to go to the ballet. Okay, and then you have the symmetric situation with soccer. If, we, if they both go to soccer, then soccer spouse is extra happy, but they're both kind of happy because they're hanging out. If they miscoordinate, you know, if the ballet spouse goes to the ballet and the other spouse isn't there, they're gonna feel so sad that it's just not even fun. Okay, so they both get a payoff of zero. So what's going on here is there's an element of cooperation, right? They both wanna arrive at the same place, but there's also kind of an element of competition because they both want that same place to be somewhere different. Okay? All right. So, what is the Nash equilibrium of this game? This is, this is not a fun game, but this is the, another audience participation bit. Who wants to take a stab? In the front? 50-50? Turns out no. Turns out that is not an equilibrium. Either always picking soccer or always picking ballet. Sort of, yeah. So it turns out that ballet, ballet is indeed an equilibrium, right? We can tell it's an equilibrium because conditional on my correct belief that the other spouse is gonna go to the ballet, I should definitely go to the ballet. If I switch to soccer, things get worse. So that's how I'm gonna ex maximize my expected utility with respect to this kind of degenerate deterministic distribution. But indeed, it turns out there's more than one Nash equilibrium. There's actually Nash equilibria, because if you both go to soccer, I mean, exactly the same reasoning goes through, right? We said ballet first, just because it's written down first. And it turns out that th the situation is even worse than this, because 50-50 turns out not to be an equilibrium. However, randomizing in a slightly different way is. It turns out that if the row player goes to the ballet with two-thirds probability, and the column player goes to the ballet with one-third probability, that's an equilibrium. The reason that's an equilibrium is because um, it, makes it, it, it makes the expected utility for either action equal, right? So one spouse is gonna randomize in a certain way, that makes the other spouse indifferent. If they both happen to randomize in that way, then they'll both be indifferent and it's an equilibrium. But it's kind of a fragile one. There's no particular reason why you should randomize in that way once the other spouse is randomizing in that way. It would also be a best response to just deterministically pick ballet, if that's your thing. So these predictions are not super helpful. This is, this is the first problem that game theory is gonna point out to us, right? Nash equilibrium seems in some ways reasonable. It seems like everybody's kind of doing the right thing, right? We're all like optimizing our utility, that's what we like. But if I actually wanna know what to do, it's telling me I should either play one of my two actions or the other one, or maybe, maybe I should randomize between them. It's like, thanks game theory, that is literally every possible thing. Okay, so let's come back to another issue. And this is, this is a little bit out of order so that I can make another point afterwards. So I said earlier on, maybe we wanna maximize total reward. Maybe we're somehow benevolent. I want everybody's sum of rewards to be as big as it could possibly be. I'm gonna do that by optimizing the environment. I'm gonna maximize over P, okay? 
So it turns out, I, I didn't tell you this, right? But it turns out that utility values between agents can't actually necessarily be added up. It's not necessarily meaningful to add up the utility between agent one and agent two. And that's because utilities are just representations of preferences. They just tell me how the agent is going to behave. But if I multiply agent I's utilities by 10 at every possible outcome, then the thing that maximized their utility before is still going to maximize their utility with these, these pumped up utilities. It's as if they're in different units, but they're still the same value. And it's even worse than that, because actually I can add a constant to everybody's utility as well. Add an arbitrary constant, and it'll, it'll also not change their behavior. So we're not, again, I'm not going to belabor this one in this talk, but this is another issue that I want you to be aware of. Because it's not always straightforward to know how you can optimize the total utility, because you can't even add those things together. Right? One of them is, is denominated in, in muffins, one of them is denominated in waffles. How much do you like muffins? Hmm? Do I like it more, more than you or less than you? I mean, it, it can be either. Yeah. Is there, so the question is, is there a reasonable way to normalize? That is a philosophical question. With people especially, that's a philosophical question. With robots, not so much, right? If, if we actually all control the same robot, then maybe there's some sense in which we know what the real units are. So this is a, this is a way in which utility is, is subtly distinct from reward. Yashua? Give everyone the same number of votes, but what if it turns out that one person really would be just so much better off, right? This is, this, and this is, actually, this is actually not even how we run our lives in the real world. In the real world, we don't just say majority rules, period, right? We often say we need to protect the rights of a minority. Just because everybody thinks that it would be super awesome to have, I, man, how am I gonna stumble into this without, without hitting a minefield? <laughs> am I gonna do French? I'm probably not gonna do French, right? Okay. Um, suppose that it's really important to some people to eat muffins. <laughs> no, everybody's angry about that one too. <laughs> okay, it's really important to some people to eat muffins. It's so important that even if everyone else votes for waffles, it might just make sense for us to set some muffins aside. Right? And, and part of that is just because um, it's because the, you can't really trade off one person's well-being against another's in a straightforward way, right? So there's a deeper issue than, the, than just this units issue. And again, this is where it gets philosophical. You know, is it really fair necessarily to make one person arbitrarily poorly off if it benefits everyone? If you're a utilitarian, maybe yes. It's a different kind of utility. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to solve that problem today because I'm not in the business of sol solving problems today, and I'm, I'm in the business of posing them. Okay, but the, the, the problem that this poses in our more restricted sphere is how should we reason about mechanism design then? If I can't just total up people's utilities, like what am I even up to here? So there's two answers to that, okay? There's one answer which is often used in the real world, which is you punt and you say, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, whatever, but I'm just gonna count everything in money and that's what we're gonna do. And that's kind of a reasonable approximation in some situations, right? If everybody's got basically the same amount of money and we're really just selling ads anyway, so who cares, um, then, then you can do that and you can make some progress. And that, that's often what people will do. But we need to be aware that that's just not always the right answer. Okay? And game theory actually has a theory about that. Okay? They, it's called Pareto optimality. Okay? So this is a way of comparing outcomes even though we can't compare individuals', individuals utilities. So it basically consists of two definitions, okay? The first definition is Pareto domination. We're gonna say that a profile of utilities, Pareto dominates some other profile, so X dominates Y's. If it's the case that every X is weakly larger than its corresponding I, sorry, Y, and furthermore, for some agent, that's a strict inequality. So maybe everybody likes X better than Y, maybe everybody doesn't care except for one person likes X better than Y. Both of those count as Pareto domination. So another way of saying that is every agent is every bit as happy with X as they would have been with Y, and at least some agents are even happier. Okay? So we're gonna say that, okay, well, before I move on to the next, so why would this be a definition we care about? Because even if you can't compare utilities, it's clear that you should prefer X to Y, right? Everybody likes X better than Y. There's no, you're, there's no trade off, right? You can, you can make things better for everyone by choosing outcome X instead of Y. 
So that's a way in which you can sidestep some of these philosophical concerns and say, regardless of whether we are, you know, muffinophones or something else, maybe, maybe I'm still just gonna prefer to pick X, and I don't have to really have an argument about that. Oh, it actually has, right? If I add the same constant, so the question is, that doesn't solve the problem of adding constants, but it actually does. Um, because you have to add the constant in a certain way, right? So if I want my utility function to be, in some sense, the same utility function, but still add a constant, I have to add the same constant to, to the utility for every outcome. So in this case, that would just correspond to adding the same constant to all of the x's, but also to all of the y's. So all of these, all of these inequalities would, would be the same. In the front? We, so the question is, is this the assumption here still that everybody is perfectly utilitarian? This actually kind of sidesteps that question, right? This says, so it's, it says the utility accurately measures how much you like something, but whether you're a, a perfect, perfectly rational utility maximizer is all about how you act, right? And here we're not really so talking so much about action, we're really more just talking about how much should I prefer one outcome to another? If I'm, if I'm maximizing my environment, or if I'm, if I'm optimizing over my environment, I'm gonna wanna pick an environment where I get something that's Pareto dominant. Some people's misery might make other people happy. Exactly. It's, it's sad but true. Um, and so this is, again, part of the issue is that this is going to be encoded in those utilities already, okay? All right, great question. Okay. So then we're just gonna say that an outcome is Pareto optimal if it's not Pareto dominated by any other outcome, okay? Those of you who have done um, multi-criterion optimization will have seen this before, right? There'll be often a Pareto frontier. There'll be many possible Pareto optimal outcomes where you can, you can if, you, if you pick something on the, on the frontier, you can do better without having to make any trade-offs over anything in the interior, okay? Okay. So why am I telling you all this? Because of the next thing that's wrong with multi-agent systems, which is that individually rational behavior is not always globally optimal, okay? We saw this with the prisoner's dilemma. And now that, we've, now that we've learned game theory, we're all game theorists, we can analyze this precisely. We can say, uh, hey, what outcome is Pareto optimal in the prisoner's dilemma? Who wants to take a stab? What's the Pareto optimal outcome? If they both cooperate, that is indeed Pareto optimal, right? There's, there's definitely, I definitely prefer that, or there's definitely nothing that dominates that, right? No, no outcome Pareto dominates both cooperating. Turns out there's two other Pareto optimal outcomes as well. If one person defects and the other one cooperates, that is also Pareto optimal. Even though it's not optimal in the sense of adding up utilities. Why is that? Well, it's because Pareto optimality is a weaker condition than maximizing total utility, okay? So let's consider this case. So the row player cooperated and got minus five, the column player defected and got zero. If I wanna make the row player better off, the only way for me to do that is for the column player to get something worse than zero. Okay? So if I'm gonna improve things from here, I'm gonna have to make a trade-off. And Pareto optimality is all about there being no way to improve things without making a trade-off. Okay. So this, this, this is in some ways is interesting. There's, there's lots of Pareto optimal outcomes here. And yet, let's, let's ask the next question. And because of my grouchy title, uh, you could probably guess, but who wants to take a stab at what the Nash equilibrium is in this game? That's actually a very strong Nash equilibrium. Defect, defect. That is the unique Nash equilibrium in this game. Which is unfortunate, because that is the only outcome that is Pareto dominated, right? Defect, defect, we both get minus three. Cooperate, cooperate, we both get minus one. We would both be better off if we just both cooperated. And globally, everyone would be better off if we just both cooperated. But the logic of utility maximization says that we won't. So let me just quickly run you through why that is. So imagine that, imagine that the other player, the column player, is cooperating. If they are, so, so they're the column player and I'm the row player. If they cooperate and I cooperate, I get minus one. 
But if they cooperate and I defect, I get zero. So if they're gonna cooperate, I should defect. But then if they defect, I should also certainly defect, because then I'll get minus three instead of minus five. It's actually a dominant action for me to defect. So what this tells us is that if you individually optimize, if every agent is perfectly rational and just maximizing and just doing the best they can on an individual basis, you can lead to the, that can lead to the worst possible outcome. The worst thing that can happen, the Pareto dominated outcome. So that should worry us in this setting where we only get to control one agent and we only maybe care about optimizing our own utility. Okay, I've been promising you a fun game, another fun game. This is the last one, but please do come back when it's time. Okay, this one also has a fun story. There's always a fun story. Things are often dilemmas. Here's how this one works. There's two travelers, traveler one and traveler two. They go to some exotic location like New York. They both buy some rare, precious antique like a Statue of Liberty keychain and then they put it in their luggage and they fly home on the same plane. Well, the airline loses both of their luggage, okay? The airline doesn't know how much the knickknack was worth, but they know they need to pay back the amount that it was worth. So they somehow put these two travelers into separate cells, and they ask them, how much was it worth? Now, the airline knows that it was worth an integer number of dollars for some reason, let's just assume, and they also know that it was worth between $2 and $100. So you need to say some number to the airline. Each person is gonna say some number to the airline. And the airline reasons as follows. If you both say the same number, then you're probably telling the truth. We'll just give you that number. If we both say 95, we both get 95, okay? If you both say a different number, the airline is going to assume that the person who said the smaller number was lying. No, the other way around. The bigger number was lying. The smaller number, wh why would you say a smaller number than the truth? That's crazy. No, the person who said the bigger number was lying. So they're gonna give you both the smaller number, except as a thank you for being so honest, they'll give the person who said the smaller number an extra $2. And as a punishment for being a dirty lying liar, they will take $2 away from the person who said the bigger number. So you pick two numbers, so that, that, that's the fun story. I'm gonna very quickly say this again, just in numbers. You pick, the, you pick a number simultaneously. If it's the same, you both get that number as your payoff, okay? If you pick different numbers, then we color in the smaller number and give that to everyone, except that the person who said the smaller number gets a bonus, and the person who said the bigger number gets the smaller number minus a penalty, okay? Clear to everyone? All right, again, let's play. We don't need to do three games necessarily this time, but let's play once or twice against someone nearby. Okay, this is your 10 second warning. So if you're still agonizing about how to play the game, like wrap it up.
Okay. So there's going to be a there's going to be a test. It's an important test. This is how I'm going to trick you into listening to me, but there actually is going to be a test. The trick is just the importance. Okay? All right. So we've all had a chance to play the game. And now we're going to do a, an also a poll, but I'm not going to ask sort of binary questions about whether you did 100 or whatever. That would take forever. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to do a decumulative distribution. Okay? So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to say who played such and such a number or higher. Okay? And everybody for whom that is true, your hand is going to go up. Now, the important thing is, I will then ask a question, who played such and such a smaller number or higher? More people's hands will go up, but these hands stay up, right? That's how this works. We've got this monotonicity property. Eventually, all the hands will be up. Okay? All right. So let's start at the top, because that's how we get monotonicity. Who played 100 or more? <laughs> Honest question, how did that work out for you? <laughs> Pretty OK, right? Like, OK, maybe not. This is, OK, this is interesting. I want to follow up on that later. OK, who played 99 or more? OK, some sneaky people. Who played 98 or more? Good. 97 or more? OK. OK, who played 95 or more? All right, now it's getting interesting. Who played 50 or more? OK. Who played 5 or more? OK, you can all put your hands down now. Smart Alex in the audience who played 2. Hands up. Yeah. Yeah, there's always some. OK. How did that work out for you, by the way? Did you get a utility of 4 or greater? Sometimes. Did anyone get a utility of 5 or greater by playing 2? No, that's not how the game works. <laughs> People who lost the game by playing 100, how many of you got 90 or more? And it's not about winning or losing, right? It's about that delicious utility. OK. So there's a unique equilibrium for the traveler's dilemma. It has exactly one. So game theory is making a real prediction for the traveler's dilemma. This is, not, this is not battle of the sexes again. This is not the equilibrium, though. And it's fairly straightforward to see why. Because if the other player is playing 100, and I play 100, I get 100. That's awesome. But that's not the biggest possible payoff. Because if I play 99 against their 100, I get an extra 2. And then I get 101. And I'm an expected utility maximizer, not embiggener. I maximize. I pick the biggest. So there's no reason to ever play 100. It's actually dominated, right? But because there's no reason to play 100, and everybody knows that as perfect spheres of rationality, it's kind of as if, well, OK, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's kind of as if there is no 100. And so if there's no 100, and I know the other player is going to play 99, the best thing for me to do is not to play 99, because then I would get 99. If I play 98, I'm going to get 100. So in fact, there's no reason to ever play 99. <laughs> and you can see where this is going. <laughs> this is the unique equilibrium, the only equilibrium of the game. So the point of this game is that Individual optimization can lead to the nearly worst. It's not actually the worst. The worst is someone else plays two against me, and I play a higher number, and I get zero instead of two. But it can, it, that's only the second. That's only one worse. So individual optimization can lead to the nearly worst individual outcome. So it's not even some story about how we would all be better off if we blah, blah, blah. Like, no, like even just one person would be better off to not individually optimize in this way. Question in the front? Right, so the, the question is, how, be, how belief dependent is this, right? So, um, exactly. So I smuggled something in there. I said, therefore, there's no reason to ever play 100. That's actually true. But then I said, therefore, there's no reason to ever play 99. 
I was being a bit sneaky there, right? I'm, I'm assuming something about people's beliefs. I'm assuming that they believe the other player is rational and has spotted this dominance. If I happen to have the belief that the other player is gonna play 100, even though it's dominated, then actually I should play 99. And that's at the crux, because that, that belief is not in equilibrium, right? So the Nash equilibrium will never have that belief. Or, or to put it another way, no agent who is playing in Nash equilibrium will ever have that belief. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, yeah, but what about beliefs? I, you, you just said we'd take expectation over beliefs, right? And that's exactly right. So, so I'm, being, I'm being careful here, right? So I'm not just talking about expected utility maximization. That's part of this. But the other part is equilibrium, right? Equilibrium says not only am I maximizing my expected utility, I'm maximizing it with respect to believing that the other person is also maximizing their expected utility. If I believe the other player is playing 100, I don't believe they're maximizing their utility because they're playing a dominated strategy. Joshua? But in the real world, you can count on a third party and have contracts in the real world, right? Yes. So the question or, co or comment is, in the real world, we can count on some third party. We can, we can give ourselves commitment power. And that's true. And that's how you get out of some of these situations. And then the question you have to ask, though, is what is that third party actually going to do? Because they aren't actually magic, right? They can't actually magically commit us. In, in fact, what really happens is they'll punish us in some way. And so then what they're doing is they're doing mechanism design. They're setting up a whole situation where all these terrible agents who have no willpower or ability to commit are nevertheless going to behave in some proper way. true, but actually choosing contracts is tricky too because there's limit. I, I want to talk to you about contract theory. That's a whole field. We'll do that after though. Okay, I had one other question over here. Ha, yay, okay. So sometimes the question is, is being honest here considered irrational? So notice I didn't tell you how much the knickknack is worth. And some people, like if, if I, you know, I play this with my friends in a bar sometimes. And I'll say to them, you know, I'll tell them the little story, and I'll say, why don't you guys play? I'm going to make a little point about game theory here and how it just doesn't work. And they'll say, okay, sure, but how much is the knickknack worth? And I'll say, well, that's not the point, right? The story is just so that you understand the rules of the game. We're just, we're just talking about, and they'll say, but how much is it worth? <laughs> so you're saying, how much is it worth? Or, I mean, to put it a little bit more charitably, you're saying, why are you getting so frustrated, James? Is it really so, is it really so irrational to just say what it's worth? And the answer is yes. Right, under, under this, so agents aren't psychopaths, but everything they care about is encoded in their utility, right? So to the extent that I care about being honest, that must somehow be reflected in these numbers already. So you can imagine that all I care about is the numbers. And if all I care about is the numbers, then I care about getting the biggest possible number, whether I'm telling the truth or not. Okay. Nope, what have I done? Ah, okay. So bad with clickers, I'm gonna put that down. All right, so, the po right, the, po the point that I was making here is that um, this is the worst thing, okay? And that's not even the worst thing that you can see, say about the traveler's dilemma. The worst thing you can say about the traveler's dilemma is it's not even accurate, right? And we saw that just now. If real people play the Nash, or sorry, not the Nash equilibrium, if real people play the traveler's dilemma, what happens is they play sort of 97 to 100, right? Some people play two but not many, and those people are dramatically worse off than the people who play this irrational strategy. This, this example is what drove me to something called behavioral game theory. This is the one that convinced me that game theory was somehow missing something. Because if I'm, if I'm perfectly rational and that's causing me to reliably lose money, in what sense is that perfect rationality? But there's another wrinkle here, which is if I change the game a little bit in some way that doesn't change the Nash equilibrium at all, okay? If I change the penalty from two to 50, people start playing the Nash equilibrium. It makes a big difference. But the equilibrium hasn't changed at all. And so what that tells you is that you can't think of equilibrium as just an approximation, right? You can't say, sure, sure, people aren't, people aren't rational, but they're kind of rational. And so it's easy to derive perfectly rational behavior, so I'll use that as my approximation and we'll just assume that's gonna be kinda close to what people really do, right? What this tells you is, first of all, no. Um, changing things that don't change that approximation very much change people's behavior. And second of all, no, because in fact, people's behavior can be exactly the opposite of what Nash equilibrium predicts. 
the modal action here is 100, right? The thing that most people play is 100. So Nash is not capturing really the whole story or even necessarily part of the story for how people behave. Okay. So then quickly, multiple Nash equilibria. We complained about that a minute ago with prisoner's dilemma. No, with battle of the sexes. That can happen even in a perfectly, perfectly cooperative game in a really straightforward way, right? Let's play the driving on the road game. If we both choose left, we win, we get where we're going. If we both choose right, sure, fine, whatever, that's also good. If one of us chooses left and one of us chooses right, things get ugly, okay? Well, it turns out there are two equilibria here, of course. In fact, nope, lied to you, there's three. This time, 50-50 randomization is actually an equilibrium, whoever said that. Yeah. Um, so again, like, in some sense, game theory doesn't even tell you what side of the road you should drive on. That seems like the simplest possible multi-agent system. Okay. And then there's just, this has kind of just been like a laundry list of complaints about game theory. Here's my last item on the list. Best response is the bedrock of, of all of the predictions that game theory makes. Game theory says, uh, my, con my, it, my main condition on how a game theoretic agent is going to behave is that they are going to best respond to their beliefs. And I just, I write this little equation. It's got like five letters. It's super easy. How long could that take? It's so hard, right? In any real situation, best responding is like the whole problem. Chess and go and poker, well not poker, chess and go and let's say shogi, game theoretically, they're super simple, right? In this world of perfect abstract math, they're easy. And yet, it turns out that they're super hard because computing the best response to your beliefs is actually very difficult in any, well, not in any real situation, but in, in many, many, many situations. So what's going wrong? Why is game theory failing us so badly? There's a kind of two kinds of reason. So one thing that's going wrong is we can't even do what it tells us to do, right? It says best respond, and I say how, and it's silent. Okay? And in fact, this is, this is true in general. So this is, a, this is an exciting result that what came out after I started my grad degree. It turns out that finding a Nash equilibrium is computationally hard. It's not NP hard just because they're guaranteed to exist, but it's this other thing, p-pad completeness. So it's as it can be as hard to find as anything that is guaranteed to exist. The other thing is Nash equilibrium is about what satisfies conditions. Right, it's very post hoc. It says, sure, you tell me people's beliefs and their actions, and I'll tell you, you know, is that a Nash equilibrium or not? Does it satisfy some condition? It doesn't tell you how to get there. It doesn't give you any story about how anyone ever would get there. So as a prediction, it's not, there, it's not very convincing, because there's no story about why this is happening. And that's why you get multiple equilibria. It's also why you don't get any comparison between the equilibria. So I said unordered here. So which is better, the left-left equilibrium or the right-right equilibrium? I don't know, is that even a meaningful question? What about battle of the sexes? Is it better for them both to go to the ballet or better for them both to go to the other one, soccer? I don't know. Game theory has nothing to say. Okay. So these, these two things are problems with game theory, right? These are problems with the formalism that, that lets us reason about these situations. But there's a third problem. And this is, this is what I was kind of hammering away at with the traveler's dilemma and prisoner's dilemma a little bit. Is that unrestricted individual optimization, right? So if we're both just, just single-minded optimizers, then what that means is if our interests aren't perfectly aligned, those differences can snowball and lead to really large, large differences in, or really large um, differences in outcome compared to some theoretical optimum, whether your optimum is Pareto optimality or total of utilities or whatever. So you, you know, battle of the sexes, you start out, it's not actually, you know, we're pretty much on the same team, and yet we don't know what we're gonna do, and in fact, we might wind up randomizing, which has a very poor expected utility, it turns out. It's just that you can't improve your expected utility if the other person is also randomizing in that way. So I wanna kinda close out by making two related points. So the first point I want to make is that one of the things we've seen here is that you have to think really carefully about what you're trying to do in a multi-agent system. 
You should always think carefully about what you're trying to do. You should never just pick some loss function off the shelf, sure, sure. But in a multi-agent system, that's especially true. Right? We don't even really necessarily know what we're up to. So in the economics world, there's, there's three different ways of, of thinking about these kinds of problems. Okay? There's normative, you can think about things normatively, descriptively, or positively. So if you're gonna model something normatively, you start from axioms and assumptions, and then you derive some consequences. And this is what's going on in most of game theory, right? You start from this expected maxim, or sorry, expected utility maximization assumption, you start from this rational beliefs assumption, and you kinda just go from there. And so a lot of the problems that we saw with game theory come from the fact that those assumptions are just wrong. We're not all expected utility maximizers, we don't all have fully accurate beliefs, and so what do the consequences of those wrong assumptions even mean? Another problem that comes from just, just doing normative modeling is what I discussed earlier, or just now, right, is that it doesn't tell you anything about process. It just tells you about so whether something is a consequence or is not, and it doesn't tell you how you got there. So another approach you can take is you can say, okay, what if I forget about game theory for a minute, and I just ask myself, how do these agents actually behave? What if I want to be rational, but I'm not perfect? Then I need to get my beliefs from somewhere. So can I come up with some rational, or sorry, some accurate beliefs about how people actually behave, or, or the other agents in the system? That's how we're gonna get all of these pies that we're conditioning on. We need these things in order to actually evaluate how well we're doing. So if I come into some situation with my multi-agent system, with my multi-agent algorithm, rather, and I wanna ask myself, hey, how well is it doing? I cannot answer that question. How good is my poker agent? Oh, poker's a bad example. Zero-sum games are special. How good is my three-player StarCraft agent? You can't answer that question on its own. All you can answer is, how good is it in an environment that contains the following agents? Right? When you're evaluating things like StarCraft, you play tournaments. You can't just say how well is it doing. How well it's doing depends on the other agents that it's playing against. The other thing that is really useful about descriptive modeling that kind of gets to an earlier question we had is it gives you insight into bounded rationality. You know, we don't, we're not perfectly rational, but we're not arbitrarily crazy either, right? People are, are rational, but in some limited way. And it's hard to really know what that means. One way that you can understand how that, what that means is by understanding what are the heuristics that people use. How do people actually reason about these situations? We're kind of existence proofs for bounded rationality. And descriptive modeling can help us understand that conceptually better. Okay. So once you've got your descriptive model, you can do something called positive analysis. You can go out and try and solve some problem. You can tell we're at the, end of the, at the end of the talk, so I'm not gonna tell you how to do that. So there's two kinds of problems you could have. And we, we, we saw this, right, with, with the different kinds of um, objective you can maximize. You can either build some agent that's gonna try and achieve some individual goal. Okay, I'm gonna try and get the best bundle of goods I can when I go to the market. I'm gonna try and win some game against someone, something like that. Or you can design an environment for the agents. Right, you can say, now that I know how the agents are gonna behave in response to the environment that I design, I can pick the environment that they're going to react to well, such that, every, you know, such that the market clears and everyone gets the goods they need, such that the, ob the precious you know, knick-knack goes to the person who values it the most, such that data gets rooted, rooted in the most efficient way. So most of my work falls into the descriptive side. And I, I was originally gonna run you through, very quickly, one of my papers, and I will not, because we have 51 seconds left. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to apparently lose my slides. I don't know what happened there. Just went too fast. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's not do that. Nope, 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 I have some final thoughts first. Okay. All right. So, 
This has largely been a talk where I kind of complain. You might say to yourself, fine, like, why don't I just forget about it then? It sounds really hard. As more of our life gets algorithmically mediated, right, more and more of our everyday life is going to be happening on platforms, and it's going to be happening online. And this is not just restricted to voluntary choices that we make. Right? As more and more government functions are algorithmically informed, right? bail decisions are informed by artificial agents that try to predict whether someone's going to reinvent, reoffend. That's happening now. Credit decisions are something that you never had control over, and that's only, gonna, that's only going to intensify. As more and more of our life becomes algorithmically intermediated, it's going to become imperative for us to understand, to be able to reason through the implications of a multi-agent system. Okay? We've always been in a multi-agent system, right? It's not like it was just me before you guys showed up. But what's different is that we're dealing more frequently with new multi-agent systems. We've had about a thousand years to perfect, you know, market operation. We've had thousands of years to, to refine our notions of how we should run our government. We don't have that kind of time anymore, right? Things are happening much faster. So we can't just do this by trial and error. We need to be able to think it through, and we need to be able to avoid some of these landmines. The other thought is, unfortunately, this is a wide open area. Unfortunately, because if these problems were solved, we would be able to reason about all these new systems. But fortunately for us all, this is a wide open area, because this is going to give us something to do, because we're all multi-agent systems researchers now. Okay. I mean wide open, right? We saw this in the talk. We don't even really have a coherent notion of what optimal behavior is. If I ask you, what should an, what should an optimal agent do? when they show up to a multi-agent system? You can't answer that question yet. You have to say things like, well, what are the other policies of the agent? I don't know. We should know what optimal behavior looks like in theory. Right? OK. Finally, although game theory was my whipping boy for this talk, I love game theory. I kid because I love. Game theory is awesome, and it's what drew me to this area in the first place. Game theory lets us reason in a really precise way about some of these issues, right? Some of the things that I showed you were just game theory being its crazy old self and maybe Nash equilibrium doesn't matter. But some of the things I showed you are just really fundamental issues of a multi-agent system that we might not have spotted or that we might not have been able to get a precise handle on if we couldn't formalize it. But it's not enough. We need to know descriptively how people and software agents are going to respond in a multi-agent system if we're going to know how to, how to interact with it productively. That's, that's related to the part where we don't know what optimal behavior is. In this world where we don't know what optimal behavior is just for its own sake, the next best thing we can do is to have a good belief about how other people are going to act so that we can act productively with them. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. I believe we have minus four minutes for questions. Oh, Cam is saying one. One question. Idea in the front? Oh, yay. So, okay. So the question is, what did you mean by, in poker, it's not enough to do best response? If that's what I said, I misspoke, because actually poker is a special case where um, it actually kind of is enough to do best response. But it's, it's complicated. So it's, it's, not, it's not so much that it's not enough to do best response, but it's that there's, there's partial information. Right? So something like chess. I, oh, right, right. So the, the, in this part, I was talking about how chess is game theoretically simple. It's super simple in theory, right? Because you can see the entire state of play. Everybody knows the rules. Everybody knows everyone's utility. Right? So in theory, it's very straightforward to find the equilibrium of, of chess. In theory, with poker, there's some extra complications even aside from the fact that, you know, best response is impossible to compute. Great. All right. Uh, so one last thing. James was also part of the organizing team for the conference, so let's give James a big hand and thanks. Yeah.